Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for staying. <laughs> My name is Josh Jackson, and I am here making my Broadway debut. Which, in and of itself, would be a dream come true. But I'm getting to do it in a play called Children of a Lesser God, being directed by Kenny Leon with this amazing woman, who I will introduce to you in a second. I'm sure you've heard, actually I've heard some of the stories that you've heard, so I know that you've heard a bunch of stories today. But we want to tell you one more, and it is the story of how we first met, it's the story of how our play got off the ground. But most of all, it's the story of what happened when we started listening and truly trusting each other. But before I go any further, I want to introduce you to the amazing Lauren Ridloff. So, how many of you are fluent in ASL? Right. I want you to remember that feeling, because it's going to be important in just a second. But before we go any further, I want to introduce you to the third member of our team, Candace. Stand up, Candace. She's going to be interpreting for Lauren tonight. So just to make sure nothing was missed. <laughs> I'm going to reiterate what I said before. I said, thank you, Josh. My name is Lauren Ridloff, and I play opposite his James as Sarah in Children of a Lesser God. Let me tell you a bit about the premise of our play. It's a story of a hearing man and a deaf woman who fall in love despite their struggle to truly listen to each other and connect. It takes place at a school for deaf children. It's a timeless love story that taps into everyone's innate need to feel connected to another person. This story was first performed on Broadway 40 years ago, and I am so proud to see this revival happen again especially with what's happening out in the world today. This story serves as a reminder for all of us to stop judging and start listening. Now, the story we want to tell you tonight is the story of when we first met. That is the story of the first read-through of this production of Children of a Lesser God. As a little preamble, Kenny and I had actually worked before two years ago exactly this month. And he had started telling me in that time that he had wanted to get this thing off the ground. So flash forward to November before last. He gives me a call. He said, in order to get the ball rolling, I'm putting together a read through. And I've got a cast of people, some who I've worked with before, some I want to work with in the future. But I can't find our leady lady, Sarah Norman. However, I have been taking sign language classes from this amazing, beautiful woman who is intense in all of the right ways. And if you don't mind, I think I'd like her to do the reading with you. And if I've learned anything from Kenny, I've learned to trust his instincts. So of course, I said yes. So that's all the preamble. Now we get into the rehearsal day. For those of you who haven't done these things before, they're broken into two pieces. There's the rehearsal day, and then there's the reading day the next day. So day one. There I am, I'm walking into the building. It's one of those all-purpose New York, we do everything production style things. So going up in the elevator, they're doing stretches. I'm out in the hallway. The kids are learning their lines. The grown-ups are still learning their lines. There's show tunes coming out of every room. Walking down the hall, I get into our rehearsal room and it's filled with some familiar faces. Kenny's there, some people I know, some people I just know of. And standing right in the center of it all is this beautiful, kind-eyed woman, Lauren. Now, I can't actually remember who it was that introduced me to her the first time, whether it was Kenny who just took me right over or whomever. But what I do remember is what came next. 
So we get introduced, we say our hellos through the interpreter, and I am immediately hit with this intense feeling of shame. Because I thought that I had prepared myself to do this reading. I had spent, frankly, a month with the material up to that point. And now here I am, face to face with the woman I'm going to be doing the reading with, and I realize I haven't bothered to learn even one word of her language. So Josh just shared with you his experience of meeting me at the first reading. For me, it was a dream come true, just <laughs> as his. But this is where our stories diverge. Josh had a dream where he was able to make specific decisions about what he wanted to do. And the second difference between us is how we use our voices, obviously. So that first day of the reading, when we met, when I accepted the offer to participate in the reading for Children of a Lesser God, I already knew the story, but I didn't make the connection that was going to happen. I wasn't that or I really understood that I was going to have to use my voice. And when that light bulb went off, it was terrifying. <laughs> I'm going to have to use my voice in a room full of strangers and I'm going to have to use my voice with Pacey from <laughs> Dawson's Creek. I didn't even know if I still had a voice. I have a question for all of you right now. How many of you saw the 1986 movie Children of a Lesser God with William Hurt and Marley Matlin? Raise your hands if you did. You did? Yes. A lot of you did. A lot of And so you remember that scene where Marley screams? Raise your hand if you remember it. My parents took me to see that movie when I was 8. So I don't remember a lot. I remember some slices of the movie, but I vividly remember the people sitting around us and their horrified reaction to Marley screaming. So at this read through, I was worried that I would be judged. I was sure I'd feel ashamed. The day before the reading, when we met for our rehearsal day, I asked Kenny, do I have to use my voice? And Kenny said, for this rehearsal, you don't have to use it because I trust you. Trust. That word from Kenny Leon takes up a lot of space in our room. It becomes a place that we all have to go to. Trust. So during rehearsal, yes. So during rehearsal, Mr. Mighty Ducks <laughs> became just Josh. And I saw how much trepidation he had trying to learn sign language. And I saw he wanted to do the right thing without offending anyone. And I also saw how much he cared about the story and how we were telling it. I saw humanity. So for my part, I went home that night and I was a wreck. Now, in my preparations for this, I had expected that James Leeds was going to be a difficult character. That much is obvious on the page. And I had prepared myself for having to speak in two different voices, my own, his own, obviously, and then the voice that he would use when he was conversing in sign language or simcomming with Sarah. What I somehow had completely missed is that there's actually a third voice in the script that James has to use, that of the interpreter, and that it is 
of key importance that the audience understands the tone shift that when he is using that voice, he is speaking for Sarah, as Sarah, completely unfiltered. So you add that to the fact that I hadn't learned a single word of sign language, and to the fact that I knew how important this was for Kenny, and to the fact that I knew if I completely laid an egg that next day that I was probably going to set this project back, if not by years, just like by ever. <laughs> so as you can imagine, when I arrived the next day, I was not exactly well rested. And we rock up to the rehearsal room the next day. There's a bunch of hardened, crusty New York theater faces sitting in the audience. <laughs> Some helpful human had decided to crank the heat up in the room to a balmy 85. And there we sat at our music stands, like a bunch of good kids, waiting for Kenny to introduce us. And he did. He introduced the players, he introduced the play, and then off we go. And suddenly we're just a bunch of actors reading our roles. And what do you know? It works. <laughs> Thank God. And the humor comes through, the warmth comes through, Lauren and I fall into a natural rhythm together, and the play is working. The room, shockingly, for the group assembled, is warm. And we're going now, and it's beautiful, and we're in the rhythm of the thing, and it's happening, and it's happening, and somehow I'm convincing myself that I'm actually understanding what she's signing, and we're going, and we're going, and we're going, and we all know that that scene is coming, and we're going, and we're going, and we're going, and I want Lauren to tell you the next part of this story. So what Josh didn't know at that time was the fact that I had not used my voice for 26 years. <laughs> and that was the result of a very adult decision I made at 13 years of age. After returning home from a camp one summer, I realized I didn't need my voice it's specifically my poor speech. So I decided to chuck the years of speech therapy I'd had and made my bold proclamation to my family that I had decided to turn my voice off. I chose to become mute. My voice and my speech speech served no purpose. I looked at my voice as a lemon of a vehicle for my intelligence and my abilities. So I simply removed that lemon and focused on the art of communication in other modalities, in my signing, in my writing. I even had a snappy response to the question, can you speak? I would say, can you sign? <laughs> so on the day of the reading, we all came together. We sat in a semicircle with music stands in front of us. An interpreter stood behind Josh, being his hands. But in the few hours we had been together, Josh began incorporating a few key signs into his dialogue. He took a step toward trusting me. Prior to the reading, he sent me a video clip signing a line, asking me if it was signed correctly, and I looked at it several times, and I could not understand a single thing he said. But what I did understand clearly was that he trusted me. So he took a step forward, and I took a step forward. And so when that scene came, I brushed off the cobwebs of my vocal cords. I let go of my 13-year-old self, and I screamed. And I don't know if that would have qualified as a real scream or even a squeal. It was the first time. And what I knew in that scream 
was that I looked over and I saw Josh's eyes and they were welling up. And his eyes did not imply pity or disdain or scorn. What I saw was understanding and clarity. Those are the beautiful signs of connection. <laughs> so I can't tell you, and she's being nice. My eyes were not welling up. I was bawling. <laughs> and I can't tell you exactly why. I don't have the words for exactly the why of that. I don't know if it was just the human understanding of the pain that was in that scream, and it was a scream. I don't know if it was just something more primal than that, the animal-to-animal -animal connection that has no language, that is somewhere beyond words. What I can tell you is that when I got my shit together enough, to be able to look up from my music stand and look into that room that every single hearing person in that room was in the exact same place that I was. That that feeling, that electricity, had spread like a contagion through all of us and that we were all sharing that exact same experience together in that moment. Mm. So for the first time in 26 years, I found my voice again, but in an unexpected way. I don't use the spoken word, and I still have no desire whatsoever. But I have found other ways to use my voice as an instrument for passion or strength. And I use my voice when I laugh now. <laughs> I thank Mark Medoff for writing the siren song of Sarah and James. And thank Kenny Leon for giving me the space that I needed. And I thank Joshua Jackson for trusting me. And I also thank the audience that sat in the room that day and listened. So Josh's fear of learning a new language and my fear of using my voice again, that's a huge chasm. This is, but it joined us. It is exactly what connected us. In Children of a Lesser God, Sarah tells James. We need to meet in another place not in silence or in sound, but someplace else. Thank you, everybody.